I've written a book about the economics of beer. Whenever I tell that, people start laughing. Okay? I don't know why. So I'm going to spend the next uh, 17 minutes uh, convincing you that this is serious business and very interesting economics. So 17 things in 17 minutes is passing your seatbelt. So the first one is that beer is globally by far, uh, by far the most consumed alcoholic beverage. If you look at volume, it's hugely more than anything else, but even by value, beer is roughly double uh, the value in terms of it compared to wine, for example, which is the red wine. Okay? And this uh, proportion between beer and wine in terms of value has been stable for the past 50 years, but both have gone up tremendously in terms of consumption. Now, this is not only true, this is true if we go back thousands of years. The first roots of wine or discoveries of, sorry, the first discoveries of beer were done in China about 5,000 years before Christ, about 4,000 years before Christ in Egypt, 3,000 years before Christ in Europe. And they kind of developed independently, people said, but mostly people were drinking beer in the old days. It's only since the emergence of the Greek Empire and then later with the Romans when they expanded that wine basically spread out throughout uh, Northern Africa and most of Europe. But not everybody liked uh, the Romans coming and bringing their wine. Actually, in this part of the world, people resisted it very strongly. And when uh, Julius Caesar arrived here, he basically wrote in his Didello Gallico that the Belgian Nervi and Nervi tribes and the Swedi tribes in Germany on no account permit wine to be important because they consider that the mind is enervated, the courage is impaired, men degenerate and are rendered effeminate, they become women by that commodity, which is wine. So they insisted on keeping beer in this part of the world. Now, you should remember in those, now when we think about beer, we are worried, you know, we think about obesity, we think about alcoholism, about drunk driving, etc. But for most of history, I mean, beer was considered a very healthy drink because, one, you could, you could die from drinking water, okay? So beer was the healthy alternative compared to water. And it was very nutritious food because people were starving, they were hungry, they wanted the calories, which we now try to avoid in beer. It was a food for them as much as a drink. Another reason why beer is very important in history is because of taxes. If the, we just had a new government, they spent weeks and months discussing about the new budget for Belgium, and the whole of Europe, of course, is discussing about the budget, uh, deficits, etc. If this would have taken place two, three hundred years ago, they would all be talking about beer. Because beer taxes in a town like Leuven, for example, in the 16th and 17th century, 50%, 50% of the tax revenue would come from beer taxes. The same is true in Leiden, Amsterdam, Amersfoort, Kent, etc. Uh, there's a great book by uh, John Nye, who is an American economic historian, and he writes that in the 18th century, the UK government, the revenue was 50% of it came from beer taxes. He actually claims that most of the funding of the Royal Navy, and thus of the British Empire, is funded by beer taxes. We'll come back to that. Now, how is, how, uh, how is beer produced? Beer was mostly produced in monasteries in the early, let's say, from the year zero to the year 800, roughly. Okay? And then comes around hops. And hops completely revolutionizes the production of beer, and it does so globally. So hops essentially change the taste, the bitter taste that we like today, or that many people like. But what more importantly, it basically brings in preservation in beer. Beer goes bad very quickly, normally. And so people use herbs and spices, etc. The Groot, those of you who have ever visited Ghent, there is a Groot house. And so this is a mixture of spices that people try to use to preserve the beer. But hops does it much, much, much better than that. And so when hops emerges, it transforms the global beer economy. Now what's interesting, it takes two, three, four hundred years before it's being allowed to use beer in, for example, in England, in Belgium, what's now in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in the Low Coast. And the reason is because a lot of the tax revenue of the local governments come from taxing uh, crude or from the herbs, okay? And with hops, this undermines the tax revenue of the local councils, and therefore they try to forbid it. It's only when commercial brewing takes off and they can tax the profit of the commercial brewers that governments allow hops to be used, and then it goes global. Now, the next big revolution is basically in uh, science, when science comes around in the 17th and 18th century, when there's big scientific discoveries. Louis Pasteur, we probably know him from uh, all the medicine, medical applications, but he was working on wine and beer, really, initially. And he discovered the existence of yeast. So people had been brewing beer for like thousands of years without knowing that yeast even existed. 
So he discovers these, and then people discover refrigeration, they discover how to make glass bottles, they discover all kinds of things, and now suddenly beer can become an industrial enterprise. It can be produced at a bigger scale than ever. Basically, they can produce a product which is the same, okay, not like every day it will taste differently. No, it's going to be the same. You can do quality control, you can store it for much longer, and with that, the whole industry again transforms itself. So this leads to a huge consolidation of the number of breweries uh, around the world. So these are data from Belgium for 150 years. And essentially what you see there is that <clears throat> until between 1850 and 1900 really, the number stays roughly around somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 breweries. From 1900 on, I mean, this thing collapses. So there's a huge consolidation go on, and we go from 3,000 breweries to 30 breweries in 80 years time. Okay, so the scale increases and the number goes down tremendously. This not only occurs in Belgium, it occurs all around the world. And so by 2000, basically all the countries have had just a few breweries left. And now what happens, this thing goes global. So in the 21st century, essentially the past 15 years has seen this incredible, this incredible consolidation process go, uh, basically increase and continue across the borders, if you want. So even if we go back as recently as 2000, you had a lot of uh, breweries in different countries. I mean, you had probably hundreds and thousands of breweries still exist. Then five years later, by 2005, we have seven brewing holdings really controlling most of the beer. 2010, we have five, okay? And basically we're going down because our RBA UDEF, which controls now, well, our jointly owned by the Americans and the Brazilians, now controls 25% of all the beer in the world, and they're discussing taking over the next biggest one, and so we may go down to an even further consolidated. And of course, people don't all like that. And so you have a what I call an anti-globalization movement. Okay, or this is the equivalent in the brewing world, if you want, in the beer world. And so you have what I call also the rise of the monasteries, the comeback of the monasteries, the rise of the microbreweries. We have home brewing. We have all kinds of small-scale brewing starting. And so these are data from four different countries, and the story is the same everywhere. We got a huge increase in the numbers of brewing again. It's a complete turnaround, and all the growth is at basically small-scale initiatives coming back to local products, diversity, specialty types of brews, etc. I'm sure you know it when you've been to any bar lately. Now, Let's look at what's happened. So this is what happened on the production side. How has the consumption side responded to that? On the consumption side, we see that we already know there's been a, a big global increase in consumption of beer. That's what our, my first slide showed, remember? I mean, beer consumption both in volume and value keeps going up. But what we see, if you look at, the, at there's big differences across the globe in where that growth is taking place. In the traditional beer markets, that's shown here on the, this panel on the left, that's where Belgium, Germany, the US, etc. Essentially, the peak in beer consumption is around 1980. And since then, there's really been a very strong decline in beer consumption. We now in Belgium drink roughly half as much beer as we used to drink back in uh, 1975. Okay, so there's been a big decrease. And the same thing is true in these other countries. Then you see enormous growth taking place in countries like Brazil, uh, China, India as well, Russia, you see that on the right hand panel here, and basically that's where the growth is taking place. And as a result, you see a big global shift in terms of where most of the consumption is taking place. So China now is the biggest uh, consumer market uh, for beer. Basically China's reforms, remember it started in 1978 with the first economic reforms. In 1983, important here, the Chinese market became bigger than the Belgian market. And in 2003, it became bigger than the American market. And since then, it's been going up and up and up, and it's going to continue for a while. Now, let's look at something else. Um, I'll do a quiz, okay? 30 second quiz here. So, if you look at this, this is the share of how much beer, my axis have changed, but how much, how big is the share of beer in total alcohol consumption in various countries? And so, this is four different countries. Uh, two are close to 80% and two are close to 5%. So who is whom? Well, this is going to be easy, right? So this is Italy, this is Spain, this is Belgium, and this is the UK. This is the traditional division between wine and beer. Now, this is data from 1961, 50 years ago. Let's fast forward to 2011. Now, who is who now? 
And these numbers, net number close to, the maximum is close to 50% and the minimum is close to 25%. So all have come together. Italy is still at the bottom, but much more than before. Now this is the UK. The UK has gone from 80% to 40%. This is Belgium and the number one is Spain. So Spain is consuming most of its alcohol, now it's beer and no longer it's wine. And so the next slide kind of shows this. So you see, this is the last 50 years, the same data, the same numbers. And so the top are the traditional beer drinking countries and the bottom are the traditional wine drinking countries. And what you see is you see this global convergence of alcohol consumption patterns all coming together and people have a much more mixed uh, alcohol consumption pattern than they used to have. If you put the vodka drinking countries here, same story. Now, I have two more slides on trade. Um, this is what happened to trade with exports over the past 50 years in the world, and essentially until 1980, not much is happening. Okay, you see there that basically there's very little trade on wine because it's costly. I mean, you accept, essentially you trade to export water, and exporting water is not much value, and there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> and it's very costly. So people don't do that. It doesn't make much business sense. Now, since then, things have changed a lot. So you see, this graph goes up exponentially. So the, the big increase in export is a story of the last 50 to 20 years. And this is globally, and these data are from Belgium, and here the other story is very much similar. So it's a recent story. So this is total production, the top line. This is the exports on in uh, red, and in yellow is the consumption. And so you see consumption going down. This is data from 1980, so this is the, the last 30 years, if you want, in Belgium. So consumption goes down in a straight line. And so all the growth in production is due to strongly increased exports. We essentially export now 60% of our production. Now, I have a few minutes left, and I want to make, if you're still not convinced that this is an important, uh, interesting economics and uh, basically serious business, I'm going to argue and I'm going to dispute a bit with the first speaker who said that God created Holland. I'm going to say beer created Holland, and that was in the process. So, this is on the right hand panel, you see this is a 2014 border between Holland and Belgium, and essentially this border is the same as the border which was fixed in the Treaty of uh, Munster in 1648. And this is 1648, which was at the end of the Eight Year War of the Dutch Revolt against the mighty Spanish Empire. And so this ending of the war allowed essentially Holland to separate from the Spanish Empire. And essentially this is still the end of uh, the same border as we have today. Now why is this border there? The border is there, I have to be very brief, it's essentially it was the outcome of the military conflict, it was where the, basically where the armies were stuck fighting against each other. There's no regional, no ethnic, no geographic, whatever border there, it's just the end of a military stalemate. Now, why was it there? Well, the reason was essentially that it came down, and this is very surprising because when Holland started this war, there were just a few towns and yet this huge, mighty empire. So how could they survive? How could they not only survive for eight years, how could they beat the Spanish empire and create this uh, territory? And the reason is because they know how to finance an army. Fighting had become very expensive because of technological innovation, and so you needed a lot of money to win a war. And so the Dutch turned out to be very good in financing the army. So this is the expenditures you see. So the Spanish uh, expenditures in the beginning of the war were much higher than the Dutch, but at the end the Dutch were outspending the Spanish by 2 to 1 in the army. Now where did the money come from? Well, the Spanish got it from their silver imports from Latin America essentially. That's where they got the money from. Okay? But their exports were basically gradually declining over time as so the taxes. And where did the Dutch get the money from? Taxes on beer. And you see, in the beginning, they just had a little bit of taxes, and then they and went up and up and up and up, and at the end, essentially, they financed the war, and they won the war because of their beer taxes. Now, so this, because of that, they won the war, they had the border, and so they separated, and that's why we have the, the, the demarcation between, separation between Holland and Belgium. This has all kinds of implications, but to show you one more final fact, why this is important, if there wouldn't have been beer taxes, we would have maybe won the World Cup. <laughs> With that, if you have more questions, we have a www.bureaunomics.org uh, website for the association, and there's a lot more info here. Thank you.